and welcome to today's webinar. I'm glad that you could join us for the second part of this series on the benefits of a respectful workplace during COVID. My name is Carolyn Whiteway and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the Executive Director of ERASA, otherwise known as the Atlantic Region Association of Immigrant Serving Agencies. So before we start, just a few housekeeping items as some people come in from the waiting room. Once again, interpretation is available during the webinar. So if you need interpretation in one language or the other, please click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred language. If you're bilingual and don't need the interpretation in any language, just you can ignore that. But uh, please click on either English or French uh, as, as appropriate. The, the slides will be shared on the screen in English, but you'll find the French version in the chat box if you wish to follow along. And during the periods of discussions and questions, feel free to speak in your preferred language or uh, to leave your question in the chat box. Please be aware that at, uh, there's going to be one moment during the webinar when interpretation will not be available and that's when you'll be placed into the breakout rooms to work on an exercise in small groups. So a reminder to please, when you're not talking, remember to stay on mute. You can mute uh, at the bottom of your screen on the microphone icon. That's going to help reduce background noise during the presentation. And if you encounter any technical issues, you can try to turn off your camera as it may help improve your internet connection. You can also try to leave a message um, for us in the chat box and we'll do our best to help you. Um, worst case scenario, try leaving the meeting and then rejoining. So now that all the technical issues are covered, uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am currently in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm grateful for the peace and friendship you are all joining us today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet peoples, as well as the homelands of the Innu and Inuit of Labrador. We recognize the ancestral and continued ties of Indigenous peoples to the lands and the waters in the region known as Atlantic Canada. We're once again delighted to have Michael Petipa as our facilitator today. For those of you who couldn't attend the first session, I'm going to do a short presentation. Mike is the founder of Clear Resolutions Conflict Management Services and has held various roles within government. Michael also holds several professional certifications in the areas of negotiation, conflict coaching, transformative justice, and instructional techniques. So with over 25 years of experience in conflict resolution and mediation, he's the perfect expert for this webinar series, and we feel very fortunate to have him. So finally, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming uh, Mike Pedipa. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you all for, for joining in. Uh, first of all, I'd like to to know that as much as I'd like to tell you that I'm uh, zooming in from Jamaica, I'm actually standing in my living room with, <laughs> I mean, sorry, my dining room with my laptop sitting on top of a cardboard box. However, I really find the, uh, uh, the thought of being in Jamaica doing this uh, virtually is, is uh, comforting and, and relaxing. So I hope you don't find that distracting, but also find the background a little more, uh, a little more calming than a, a plain wall with a clock on it. Anyway, welcome. And I guess for those of you who, uh, well, we'll go over uh, what we did last time in just a few moments. But so for today, what uh, we would hope to uh, accomplish over the next hour and a half is that by the end of this, um, hopefully the participants will be a little more aware of uh, you know, what a respectful workplace looks like. and you know, getting back on track when issues surface, rebuilding trust, creating a safe environment, uh, respectful communication skills and awareness of cultural and unconscious bias and how and when to reach out. And, and this is all basically geared towards either creating or maintaining respectful workplaces and 
there's a lot of things that create challenges to doing so. And particularly in a time like this with COVID-19, everything has been turned upside down. We're in a new reality. There's lots of stimulus, lots of challenges. And I guess my thoughts, uh, or at least my personal uh, dogma for this is that we can often choose even in the midst of when things are happening around us or as they say we can't control if a piano happens to fall on us but we can control how we react to that and what we do with it and how we respond so i believe that we can either swear at the darkness or light a candle and so i guess today we want to look at what can we do and what would that look like and what is within our control even when some things feel like the world's spinning out of control for us. So um, Matt, if we could go to the next one. So in the last session, we started off with, uh, again, the, the theme is the benefits of respectful workplace. And uh, the first session had to do with avoiding uh, or difficult conversations. And we talked about that there's consequences to not having those difficult conversations. So what we'd like to do is just briefly go over the highlights of some of the uh, some of the positive attributes of having that difficult conversation and finding a way to sit down and have a discussion with a person with whom you have perhaps a disagreement or uh, some type of a conflict or, or divergence of, of uh, values or whatever the case may be. And when we do that successfully, it increases the employee satisfaction, there's better morale, higher productivity, Less absenteeism. People don't avoid the workplace and the people in it because of discomfort. So there's a, it's more cost effective because everybody's there and productive. Um, it, it's an opportunity to support corporate values for respect and diversity when we're having these conversations and people get to, to uh, address situations instead of allowing them to fester. There's better retention and, and rate of employees because the more comfortable people feel in the workplace, and the more they feel respected, the more they want to show up. And I think it's a fallacy that people leave bad jobs. Typically they leave bad managers. At least that's what we hear on exit uh, interviews. And it's been a while now that that seems to be the number one cause. And of course, having a respectful workplace where people are comfortable and productive, that becomes a workplace of choice. And it's a lot easier to hire and retain people because they feel more at home more productive, more valued. And uh, I think most of us, if we were asked what type of workplace would we like to be in, obviously a respectful one would be our preference. There might be a few people that would rather be in a place where there's a lot of confusion and, and, and stuff going on, but I would say they're vastly in the smaller numbers. Matt, thank you. So the second point is uh, some of the learning points that we went over that I've more or less highlighted would be what makes conversations difficult? Uh, what's, and I think it became clear that what's difficult for one person may not be so difficult for the others. And sometimes in the process, we tend to look at other people's situation and judge, say, well, that's no big deal. I could handle that. Or why is that so important? And I think if we ask, why is that significant or important for you? We usually end up a lot further ahead than if we saw, oh, that's silly or ridiculous. You know, it doesn't, it shouldn't take any time or energy. So we also looked at the consequence of avoidance, that non-action isn't neutral, that if we don't have that conversation or if we don't address a situation, there's a lot of negative things that happens, uh, that happen first of all, in the people, particularly managers and supervisors, if they don't address a situation, then they can lose a lot of respect for people uh, from the, the employees who feel that you know, they're hiding or maybe they don't have the skills or they're afraid to deal with it. And that in itself can create a, a ripple effect throughout the organization. And, and sometimes it goes as far as people believe that it, it, uh, it has the effect of, of supporting, promoting, encouraging, or at least tolerating inappropriate behavior. And that can create a tremendous amount of uh, side, sidebar conversations and, and uh, uh, an essence of uh, feeling unappreciated. 
So we looked at changing that into developing a learning conversation where people, instead of judging, attacking, and criticizing, actually become curious and ask people, well, how did you get there? What's that about? Can you help me understand why you think or feel that way? Or more importantly, what's the impact of that on you and, and why is it important? So that when we take the approach of learning and having an open mind and being curious, that that is one of the first steps of really getting to the bottom of what's really happening and finding a way to resolve it between people. And typically when people have those conversations and understand one another, it creates a tremendous amount of respect and relationships become much stronger as opposed to more uh, divisive. We also talked about, obviously communication is a huge part of that role in particularly, and that any time that we have a difference of opinion or a conflict, that making sure that what we intend to say and what's understood and vice versa, what a person understands and check that is what did the person really mean? If the two are equal, that helps a tremendous amount to create that understanding. Even if people don't agree, if they at least understand one another, it can build respect. And of course, that comes along with the capacity to listen and really listen empathetically to what someone's saying as opposed to the fake listening as uh, I suppose Trump would call it, the fake listening of just hearing what you want to hear to load your gun and, and then fire back or use their words against them to prove that you're right. That's a whole different conversation. It's not what I would call a learning conversation and it's certainly not respectful. So there's a great power in listening. And then of course, at the end we talked about when people do come to an agreement, sometimes it's not a bad idea to have some type of a little note or a memo, even if it's just a, a an email between them that says, well, here's what we agreed to and this is how we're going to move forward. And if this comes up again, or we have difficulties, here's what we agree to do so that they can always fall back to what they have in common, what they've agreed to and make sure that it's consistent. Because sometimes I know myself as uh, the years go on, my capacity to remember details starts to slide and we can find ourselves misremembering, so to speak. So those are some of the main points. So what I'd like to know from you is, can you indicate in the poll from session one, what were the things if you were here that you found most helpful? So please choose one, hit submit, and then we'll share the results of what you felt was very helpful. And there are, I think, six choices on your screen. So please do that now. Okay, do we have everyone? Some people are still voting, Mike. Just, uh... okay. okay. Right. So I'm assuming everyone can see these. So it looks like the one that people found most helpful was the learning conversations, the power of listening, and then of course the impact of non-action. And then there was the tie for agreements, consequences of avoidance, and what makes difficult conversation is difficult. So thank you for your feedback. That's helpful to know as we move forward. Now, so let's move on to what a healthy workplace looks like. So here are some things that I've pulled together 
And I used uh, several resources. Now, I did go into the federal government's uh, Respectful Workplace Program, which I have not only taken but taught several times, and then went to each of the provinces, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland, yes, in the Atlantic Block, and uh, checked theirs, and many of them were very similar. So what I've done is I've uh, the information that you're going to receive today is more or less what they have in common and each of them may have some small variations and things to add but I, I, I feel very strongly that most of the information that we have here today is really essential information and I would encourage each of you <clears throat> if you want to know more or as as you leave here because in an hour and a half we really only have time for um, a quick overview at a high level and we will only dive into a few things a little more deeply but if you want to know more please go to your either uh, the government site on harassment healthy workplace or uh, and, and they're usually fairly easy to find and some of them actually even in human rights uh, you will you will find this information as well so what's a healthy workplace, what's a respectful workplace look like? Well, first of all, it needs to be healthy, safe, and it means safe both physically and um, emotionally, psychologically. There needs to be a supportive environment where all employees can contribute. And that means people feel valued. So everyone has air, and in air, we use that term a lot, meaning acceptance, inclusion, and respect. And of course, if the environment are those things above, then people will want to come to work. You'll see them with smiles. Often there's some social activity or people stopping by each other's desks, getting together for coffee. Every now and then there's get togethers. And I'm hoping that most of us either are in or have been in workplaces that look like this. Unfortunately, some of us have experienced workplaces that weren't. And when all this is happening, that workplace is productive and efficient. And it's also free of any type of offensive behavior from anyone, including your fellow employees, managers, third parties or contractors that are in and out of the organization, and even sometimes clients or customers. So, oh, sorry, can we back up just a bit, please? So I'm gonna ask you once again to, in your chat, Please, is there something else that you've encountered in your workplaces that a word that you would use to describe what a respectful workplace looked like that perhaps hasn't been included? And this can be something that's official or just your perspective. And so just take a moment, type one word, and within the next 30 seconds, perhaps everyone can just share that word and on chat, send it to everyone and we will see them scroll along so that we can have again your participation and and and, and enhancement of what we already have mm. i'm going to write a few of these down because they're significant Okay, thank you very much for that. And what I happen to notice is the aspect of good well, trust was probably the number one. Trust, honesty, transparency, clear communication, clear expectations. And these are all absolutely essential aspects 
that will contribute to all of the above. So thank you for your input. And uh, I, I'm, I know that we are going to address some of those for sure as we move forward. All right, so the next one, please. So this part shouldn't take very long. I'd just like to reiterate, and you will find this in whatever documentation that you look up, what is offensive behavior? And offensive behavior is, is uh, described in the document says discrimination, harassment, bullying, sexual harassment, or basically any behavior that a person knew or ought reasonably to have known would cause offense or harm. So one of the other things that um, I think most of us may live through is the fact that having policies are very important. Um, having rules, regulations, and so on. That's very important. But I'm not really convinced that it's enough. And the reason I say that is because in my realm, or in, in what I've done for over the many years, is help people deal with conflicts. And conflicts can be about the work, how the work is done, and all of the aspects that you've mentioned, communication and so on. It seems though, in I would say, every scenario that I've dealt with, that there's always an interpersonal piece that is somewhere buried in there. And policies can give us a guideline and a framework on how to act and how to be respectful and how not to discriminate and so on. However, the piece of the interpersonal human relationship seems to be mostly guided by what I would call the laws of nature or natural law. And, and I'll just take a moment to explain what I mean by that. So when people get married or they have a significant other that they live with or their best friends or even some of their family members, Yes, we all have rules and regulations within our house, within our household. But typically, what really makes us feel close to another person and feel comfortable talking to them and sharing our innermost thoughts and feelings isn't a set of rules and guidelines. It's how we treat them and how they treat us. In other words, that natural law of treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. Or be patient, be kind. Don't constantly pick out every single flaw that these are the things that in strong relationships, people treat each other with respect that seems to either come naturally or that they talk about. And I think most of you, when you put communication and clear expectations, those are critical. And there isn't a universal regulation or um, law that says exactly how to do that. But we all know it can happen and it does happen. Many of us have very good relationships and strong relationships. And I think the people I talk to, when we ask them, what does that look like? They always talk about being patient and kind and listening, um, being honest with one another, a lot of the things that you've already mentioned. So I think these things is where the human element meets the policy and regulations and that we can't ever overlook or forget the importance of that. And that also comes with the other points on this, which is awareness, prevention, and that's why doing nothing isn't neutral. And I think as managers, as employees, that in the workplace, not dealing with something is not an option for what we learned or what we discussed in the last workshop, that it will create and fester uh, and create a negative work environment. So. And I think the last thing is to recognize that it's very easy for us to start pointing fingers and it happens in many workplaces and the workplace does belong to all of us and even when we feel that we don't have any power or we don't have any say we all have rights we all have clear roles and responsibilities and I believe strongly that even when we feel like we can't make a difference I believe that a we can and b that even back in the first workshop, by changing the conversation, finding a different way to approach it, being curious instead of judgmental or confrontational, we can have conversations that can certainly make a huge difference in our lives and everybody else's around us. But it's not an easy thing to do. It takes time, 
it means changing some of our habits and our our some of the beliefs that we've held for a long time that may not be valid and for adults to change the way we do things can be a bit of a traumatizing process or it can be at least a difficult process but i do believe that we can do it and our mission here is to take a look at well what are the possibilities what are some of the tricks the keys the approaches and so on that we can put into effect that can maybe help us be the change that we want to see around us and it fortunately or unfortunately does start with us and that we do have an impact even sometimes when we believe we can't so let's take a look at these things a little further Okay, so, so this exercise is where you're going to be in breakout rooms. And there'll be three groups, and each group will have um, one message. And I think last time, we, what we struggled with was the group wasn't sure which ones they were. However, one group will take a look at making a list. They'll so only have four minutes, so make a list of what you believe are the responsibilities of employees in a workplace to contribute towards it being a respectful workplace. Group two, what are the responsibilities of the managers? Group three, what are the responsibilities of the senior executives from your perspective? Now there isn't a right or wrong. We're going to go over some of these when you're finished. So I'm not sure how the groups get assigned whether they're one, two, or three, but perhaps um, if it's not clear, I can just pop in to each of the groups and suggest it. So if we can maybe launch that. What I'd like to do is perhaps we'll go in reverse order today. Uh, we'll start with group three. And normally I start with employees and managers and senior executives, but uh, I'm going to put a little pressure on the, uh, the upper echelons and say, you know, they often say that, you know, it, it, it starts at the top and works its way down, <laughs> you know, and lead, good leadership comes from the top. So let's take a look at what uh, are the responsibilities from your perspective of the senior executives. So would someone from that group please be so kind as to share either verbally or in writing, uh, preferably verbally, what did you come up with? Oh, hi, yeah, I'm the uh, volunteer from group three. Um, Thank you, Carol. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, they're not in any particular order, it's just random, so I'll just read them out. Um, uh, clear policies, uh, especially around HR policies, we thought was really important. Uh, leading by example and listening to your staff and also not just listening, but reflecting as well. Um, okay acknowledging people as best you can on a daily basis and mm -hmm. but, also, but also thanking people on a regular basis uh, in a sincere way you know acknowledging what they do and how they do it um, okay. transparency clear communication um, we thought it was really important for someone at the executive level to be able to motivate people um, and beyond motivating but trying to uh, lift people's spirits to increase their morale um, but also as well that uh, they needed to know when to push back, not necessarily against stuff, um, but being able to recognize when there's a problem and when they need to kind of fight the good fight and, and stand up for their organization, their staff, their, their values, their vision. Um, being responsive and decisive, so not letting things drag out painfully. Um, having really clear roles and responsibilities. Um, being fair with people, so not playing favorites. Um, having some kind of a reward system, but also holding people accountable at the same time. Um, making sure that when you have staff meetings that there's action items so people know exactly what's expected of them. And also being able to have some type of a clear vision and strategy, so a, a good strategic plan um, with clear expectations around it um, of how to implement that into your day-to-day -day life. Did I miss anything in group three? Well, thank you. Well done. Um, I suspect that from the next group, we'll hear some similar things. And it's okay to uh, reiterate some things that have been mentioned previously, because there is almost always an overlap 
of things where people kind of share a responsibility. And I think, uh, well, we'll get to that in a moment. So could we, um, um, could we go to the next group? And, and thank you again, Carol, and your group. Very, very extensive list. Thank you. So group two, managers. Who's up? Shall I share? I don't know when else is volunteering. I can see Anna Macbeth's face there. You're looking relieved. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that you because I saw you taking notes. I was trying to take notes. Okay, um, so you are selected. Carmen, please join in if you think of things. <laughs> um, we felt like managers were kind of middle. We're in the middle, <laughs> we felt. So... Um, there was a, an element of we need to advocate for our employees while we're balancing, respecting the organization and the policies and the rules set by the organization. Uh, that was a big role for us. We also felt we, we were the people that we needed to give space to our team to talk, express concerns, problem solve, um, just creating a safe space for our team so that we can really understand uh, where people are coming from and what the challenges they're facing and to try and address those issues whilst we can. Um, we also felt another part of our role was um, managing staff expectations around what the organization can and cannot do. Uh, ISANS is a not-for-profit, so this is a big challenge for us. You know, even things around professional development or career paths, uh, that can be a challenge for managers and supervisors. Um, part of our role also to have honest, courageous conversations with our staff in a safe way. Um, we felt there was sometimes a challenge when expectations weren't aligned with what we could do. So there was an element of our hands were tied on certain issues. Um, another thing, I jotted a few notes from Carol about like we need to be consistent in how we apply policies within our team and also to be fair to our team. That seemed to be a big thing from my own observations create uh, trust within our team so that we help um, people perform, you know, to the best of their ability. Um, is there anything else, anyone from my group? I mean, all the other, the things that Carol said about being clear in the direction that we're going and uh, helping our team um, understand that. Is there anything else I missed from our conversation? We, were, we had more to say, but we ran out of time. <laughs> I think you covered everything. Well, thank you very much, Gina. Um, again, your group uh, did a, a, a very, very marvelous job and a, a quite an extensive list. And so I thank you for stepping up to present and uh, good job and good job to your, to your group. So now we're to group one, the employees. So what are your, what do you see as your responsibilities? Hi everyone, can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so we had a long list here, uh, so not in any particular order. Uh, the first one we talked about was creating an inclusive environment, so around a diverse and respectful workplace. Um, being open and respectful around cultural differences and asking respectful questions, uh, sharing your own experiences as well as listening to others, uh, treating others with respect and dignity. Um, having that active listening, uh, understanding that there's different communication uh, styles as well as learning styles, acknowledging that uh, you may be wrong, so going in and um, having that active listening and um, kind of really reflecting on that. Uh, modeling behavior in terms of modeling the behavior that you expect to receive from others. Uh, not being judgmental um, when you're at staff meetings, taking turns, allowing others to talk. Uh, employees have the responsibility to show up and be present at their jobs, as well as have clear expectations and clarify expectations if they're not clear. Um, doing the, the work honestly uh, and fulfilling the tasks. Uh, handling conflict early on and respectfully, avoiding um, gossip at the office, having healthy boundaries and respecting others' boundaries, 
being transparent and open uh, for that good communication and also being approachable. And if there's anything that I missed, anybody else can please, um, please add in. Yes, so does anyone have something to add that you feel is significant? Anyway, thank you, Maria. Very well done. And thank you to your group. So um, I think what we want to do is, is I just want to hi highlight a couple of things that the reason I went in reverse order is because if you start with the employees, I guess I'd like to highlight now, all the things that were said about employees, you know, about being welcoming and creating comfort and, and, and those things, there, there are a lot of them are very human elements. Uh, and, and, and what you've described really tells me that employees should be respectful, treat each other as the way they want to be treated and participate actively in trying to make people feel welcome and significant and uh, being open and honest and trustful and participate. And the interesting thing is that sometimes as people move up the ladder to different spots, they kind of either forget, not everybody, like the good managers don't, they realize that their humanity and the things that you've described on the interpersonal level are not only important, but critical at every level. Yes, you bring on more responsibilities and yes, you address situations that perhaps people at the lower levels might not. However, the way you treat the people around you is something that is always going to make a difference. And they say, you know, you might not always remember what somebody tells you, but you'll always remember the way they make you feel. And I'm convinced of that. Um, I've worked as an employee, as a supervisor, a manager, as a director, and now in my own company. And it's easy to forget that human piece and hurt someone's feelings or make them feel un, un, unwanted or uh, incompetent, not intentionally. But I think when we're conscientious and someone brings it to our attention, we do take that time. And we say, wow, I need, this needs to be addressed. And as challenging and as uncomfortable as it may be, we find a way to have that conversation and to put things back on a, on a positive rail. So um, I guess earlier when I mentioned the workplace belongs to everybody and clearly everybody has a role. Now, I'd like to flip to the next couple quickly just to show that the things that I took from many of them were very general. And I think you'd obviously, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to have this as something that you talk about and share is because your personal experiences, what you see, how you feel about it, and what's important to you is obviously important. And it enhances and goes further than what's said here. And I think that's a wonderful thing that people in workplaces that recognize that and that act upon it, they make workplaces where people want to be. So. Briefly, I think you've probably mentioned all these, so I'll quickly go through, treat others with respect, seek out information, seek training. And if you're not getting it, ask about it. Communicate your concerns directly. Now here's one that can be tricky. Communicate your concerns directly to the person. Even in cases where you feel harassed and or treat it inappropriately, if it's possible, so that's why the difficult conversation thing came first. If a person can find a way to sit down and say, hey, can we have a conversation because I was uncomfortable with that and I'd really like to discuss it, that can be the first step. And or communicate to the manager individually or after that's happened or sometimes people can go together and say, we're struggling, we need some help. What are some of the options? and contact the responsible individual to discuss the complaint or mediation services or whatever other options are available. If you've tried two or three of these steps and they don't work, then there's always someone in your organization. And I can't tell you right now exactly who that is in every single organization, but there's usually someone either in HR or employee relations or an ombudsman or someone in a conflict resolution program or an advisor or even your supervisor manager really should know or be able to recommend who to speak with if they aren't the ones. Okay, next one, please. But thank you, you've gone far beyond that and, and very inclusively. 
with your expectations and the responsibilities. So managers. So again, these are fairly broad and I think you've done a marvelous job of expanding upon them. You know, paying attention, be vigilant. An open door policy is not of much value. And this was told to me once by an employee. An open door policy isn't worth much if it's taped to a door that's always closed. So as ironic as that may seem, I think there's an absolute uh, essence of truth to that. Taking things seriously and acting upon them, leading by example and being fair, and of course, acting quickly. And again, you have added many more components to those, which I think is, is terrific. And then of course, the senior executives. Yes, they do have more um, things to, to uh, deal with at, at the uh, level of the organization, but yes, providing training and information to all employees and, and keeping that information flowing, what's important and what they need in terms of their roles of the expectations, of the framework, all the things that you mentioned. And also, when there is something that happens that is traumatizing, is to take the initiative to find the resources and or people or be directly involved in rebuilding the workplace after an incident. For example, if there is a harassment case or a discrimination case or, or there's, there's racism or any type of inappropriate uh, things that or, or trauma, traumatizing situation in the workplace that requires people to be brought through some kind of a process to help them get over it or to just be actively involved to lead them through it. And of course, I think you did an excellent job of adding meat to the bones of this last line where it says employees need compassion, stability, and hope. And when you talked about providing you know, encouragement and holding people accountable, but also recognizing uh, achievements and, and, and effort. You know, these things, that whole support structure is very important uh, for people to feel safe, to feel like they belong and they're important. Sorry, Mike, I think you're on mute. I'm not sure how that happened. Has that been that way for a while? No, just a few seconds. Oh, okay. Interesting. Thank you. So rebuilding trust after COVID. So there's three main phases that uh, you've been able to identify. And of course, I was going to say after the last presentation that we've moved through these, but it seems that now we're back into uh, like a juxtaposition where things have, have reshifted. So the shelter in place, and I think some, many of us are back to that, where we're connecting, supporting people in their homes, if they're working from home or a distance, and providing safety, kindness, and support at work for those who are able to come to the workplace. So I think many of us are still in a blended workplace. And then of course, connecting with the company purpose or pivoting. And I'd like to expand on this briefly. I've read and have seen many, many organizations where they weren't able to continue doing what they normally do. Either the products became obsolete or not important or that other things came up. And there's many stories of organizations across the country who did a pivot. For example, there was a company that was, create, uh, that was uh, producing alcohol and they decided, you know what, there's not as much of a need for that as there is for hand sanitizer. And they shifted, modified, and started producing that because it was really needed. Because people weren't buying their alcohol during this time, but they were sure as heck looking around for, for hand sanitizer. And people that were making clothing, for example, Stanfields in Toro, where they were making clothing and stuff and then realized, you know what, people need masks and they need the uh, protective equipment and they need more of those, uh, I think they're ha hazmat, yes, hazmat uniforms, the hazardous material things. And they pivoted and started producing those, A, because they were needed, and B, of course, that increases the profitability of the company. So if the company, company can shift and integrate people and get their, their buy-in on how do we pivot right now 
and go in a direction that's going to be good for everyone and really make it clear why that's happening and how they're going to do it and get their input to work together to make it happen. Some companies were very successful in doing that. Now, some companies didn't need to do that because their online business kept going the way it always had. So these are things that, you know, can take place during and even after because after sometimes they may continue. We won't know until we really get there. And some organizations may go back to what they were doing. We don't know. But if there's a flexibility and good communication, people will figure out what they need to do and where they need to be. And But that only happens, as you have clearly identified in the last project, if there's integration, if there's communication, if people are involved. So the second one is the reopening stage. And I think we started into that and now we may be heading backwards into the shelter in place again. And of course, reopening, you have to have that flexibility. And of course, people are not going to want to come to the workplace unless they know that it's physically safe, that they've got the support. And some people still, they have realized over the last while certain jobs can be done at home and maybe they're more effective being done from home. So we could end up in, even into the future with a very different looking workplace where there is more virtual. So balancing the home and office. And then of course, there's always special circumstances where people, whether it be with children or illnesses or, or so on, they may need to have special consideration. So with the special circumstances and individual variations. And of course, always honest communication positive messages. Sometimes we need to send negative messages, but I think uh, the feedback mechanisms is the sandwich method, which most people are aware of, you know, where there's something positive, something that's not so good. And then of course, that little message of hope at the end that, you know, we can get there and we have a plan and people being inclusive. Accessibility to the management team. And again, back to the open door policy, but being physically and mentally present so that, uh, and I think some of you really outlined nicely in, in, in that last frame about how paying attention, listening empathetically, all those things that are important, having that open door policy and, and actually making it real and not just a piece of paper and listen and act when needed. And then of course the post COVID work, and it seems that we're, we were preparing for that not sure if we're there, but I think we always need to think in advance. And one of my activities, or actually I'll just do this very quickly. I'd like you to think about one thing and we'll use the chat button again. What is something that you feel just in one word or two that we could start thinking about in terms of moving forward when we get to after COVID that would be helpful? So if you could, I'm not sure how this ended up on my screen. Okay. So post COVID, can you mention one thing that you feel you could do each of you individually that could help to start to prepare for post COVID and then post it and chat to everyone. So please just take about 10 seconds to do that now. Thank you.
Okay. So are there still people typing? Mm -hmm. All right. So my assumption is that everyone can see all of these because they were sent to everyone. Is that correct? And yes. It right. seems to me that you've got a, a really nice uh, variety of things to think about. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on it because there's one in here that I think says it rather nicely and that's that you know not really ready to start thinking about that yet because we're still you know we're in the midst of the second wave and I think that's fair and I think what we can do for the rest of this workshop is focus on what can we do now however it's always good to think ahead for better days and to have a bit of a plan or strategy so I thought it would be you know inappropriate for not to at least bring it up and think about it so we can if we need to set that aside and as it comes forward we continue to develop so thank you for your input now if we can perhaps go to the next page and the whole theme is what's a respectful workplace where we are and what can we do so I'm sure that all of you have had lots of information that came with the obvious so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide so of course there's the physical safety the distancing the cleanliness and protocols for those who are in the workplace either part-time temporarily and so on and that that environment become a welcoming one where there's all the things that you've already suggested communication interpersonal communication and information dissemination so that roles expectations so on are clear the third point regular one-on-ones and team meetings so again that's part of that whole communication process so that people that have specific needs or requests or questions they get a little time and I know that puts a tremendous amount of, uh, of pressure on managers and, and the, the higher executives because these are difficult times and there's a lot of, of moving pieces right now and there's going to continue to be so I know this is very challenging however I just want to reiterate again that it's important to everyone so the next one please so I think you've already mentioned in that last question I sent out some of these things creating new directions so tapping into when people do get back or even now in the midst of it there's been changes a lot of people have done this very successful and perhaps it's time to revisit and tap into the creative employees that ideas have their skill sets uh, their creativity and what do they see or need or feel or how what input they have on how things can maybe be done more effectively and just like the pivot are there different things that can happen or different products depending upon your organization and if you do need to pivot then what's that new sense of purpose and having everyone get on board with that now sometimes a few of these people slip through the cracks and I think the more we have those conversations about uh, between people at all levels about where everyone's at and what their needs are things like furlough employees what's going to happen with them now or on the return what about people and this is one of course obviously comes from the interpersonal realm survivors guilt people that have had to leave or who can't come back or who maybe have been laid off or dismissed for whatever reason there is a survivor guilt and having the opportunity to talk about it and to work through that is an important aspect of, of, of the the well-being of the employee and, and, and the workplace and avoiding broad policies that do not consider everyone's situation needs and circumstances and I know that's very challenging for for managers and executives to say well I think this is of the greater good um, but to keep that flexibility and openness to say well this is the general idea or this is a general policy however we're also aware or open to discussing the individuals that this maybe isn't working for 
or that there may be a better approach. Okay, Matt. So now we're into some pretty difficult stuff. Um, one of the things that uh, came up in terms of bias and discrimination, which can be very destructive to uh, an organization, was the whole aspect of discrimination and unbiased unconscious bias. So we have a definition here that we'd just like to go over quickly. Unconscious bias are the underlying attitudes. And of course, I got this from uh, the uh, federal government website. Unconscious bias are the underlying attitudes and stereotypes that people unconsciously attribute to another person or group of people that affect how they understand and engage with a person or group. And here are some of the examples of unconscious bias in hiring practices. And there's a fairly extensive list there. Now, since we're running a little short of time, if any of you would like a description of each of those, I have one that I can, pro that I can send to you for dissemination, if that's acceptable. Now, I could answer your question on one or two if, if you feel the need at the moment. Is there anybody that would, we'll take two. If there's two of these that you'd like explained, I will look for the sheet that's got the explanation if I can't remember. Anybody need something explained? If not, I will send you, I'd be happy to provide to you, probably to Solange, for distribution. What each of those means specifically. Mike, what is uh, yes. the horns effect? The horns effect. I actually have to look that up. Oh, it's okay. We can we can look it up later. <laughs> well, I thought I left the sheet right next to my computer. The horns effect. Well, I don't want to try and make it up or, or give any baloney. I will send that to you because I honestly don't recall exactly what that is. I know it was new to me. There's about three of them on there that were new to me, and I thought I had a good handle on this. So I'm sorry, but um, well, that's my. I, well, I apologize for not having that right at my fingertips. That's okay. But if I find it at the end, I'll come back. But I will send you a copy of all of those, and there's like a paragraph description on each. Is that fair? But thank you for the question. All right, so the next one. Oh, sorry, there was a question about the halo effect. That one I remember. And only because I remember the uh, song, <laughs> Halo. <laughs> I think it's Beyonce. Anyway, that's where someone seems so good when they come and apply. But, uh, oh, and at the end, it does say at the bottom of that thing that hiring someone due to one of these is discrimination. So the halo effect is you know, where someone comes highly recommended by people that you know and they have good, uh, you know, they have a good resume and basically they show up beaming like they have this halo, like, you know, they're the perfect ones for the job. And you may or may not have a lot of reasons to believe this, but it just appears that they're going to be the right person for the job right from the get go. And so you hire them on someone else's recommendation or because of the great things that were said. And you don't necessarily look really at what other attributes and how do they fit in to the organization. Just, oh, this person's great. They're going to be able to do fine. Okay. Oh, Carolyn, look at that. Thank you. Can we share this? The horn effect. Yes, it's the, uh, almost the exact opposite of halo. The negative qualities to them based on one known quality. For example, people tend to think that overweight people are lazy. This effect is closely related to the halo effect, which is when you attribute positive qualities to a person instead of negative ones. Thank you for sharing that, Carolyn. Okay, so moving on to the next things. Things you can do. Well, actually, I'll ask you this at the end. We'll go through this quickly. Get to know each other, team meetings, create common language, define respect. Have a code of conduct. So sometimes these things, people assume 
that we're all on the same page. And I think my experience suggests that rarely is that the case. So sometimes we need to dig down a little bit deeper, drill down. So things like having a code of conduct, defining your step, respect, those can actually happen at team meetings or on professional development days or lunch and learns or through committees where people can say, if you don't have a code of conduct in your organization, well, how should we be reacting? And the more people you have to facilitate that conversation, I think usually the better that code of conduct becomes. And define respect, because what's respectful for me might not be something that you find respectful, especially in organizations or workplaces that have quite a bit of diversity because our social backgrounds aren't the same. And uh, little things like looking someone in the eye. I know in most workplaces I've been in, we're expected to look somebody in the eye when we're speaking with them. But in certain cultures and in certain societies, that's a sign of disrespect and people are reluctant to do so. So if we know that and we talk about it, then we can find a way to say here's what is and isn't acceptable or we understand and we can make that a norm. So I've already talked about the laws of nature and uh, the communication with authority figures. So also in some organizations or in some societies approaching the boss can be a complicated scenario. One because people may not feel comfortable because within their society or, or their culture, it's not acceptable to ask questions or, or to challenge. In other organizations, and I'll choose the states as an example, many organizations, if you're not really willing to kind of get up there and put it right out there, they feel, well, you know, you're not going to be able to be the spearhead and drive things forward. So depending on where you are in the culture and background, but I think it's also partly up to the leaders to put out there, here's what some of the expectations are. Although it might not be comfortable, if you have a question, come with the question, I'll listen. I might not agree, but I'll listen. And so that people understand that it is acceptable to you and sometimes just that either permission or the awareness that it's okay is enough for them to raise their comfort level a bit. And I'm not suggesting people turn their backs on their cultures or their societies. What I am suggesting is that when we're dealing with things that are difficult, confusing, or uncomfortable, sometimes if we gently push the envelope and try to go outside the comfort zone, that's where growth tends to happen. So my analogy is if you go to the gym and you get on, whether it be an elliptic machine, a treadmill or a bicycle, there's usually these little lines across, you know, the green line, the yellow line, the red line. And the green line is where you can just, you know, have a coffee, read a book and gently cycle on that bike. And you might get a little bit tired or a little bit of a sweat after half an hour. Of course, if you get into the next the yellow zone, you're pushing a little harder and it's more dif difficult, you breathe heavier. And then in the red zone, you're really pushing hard and you're exhausting yourself. But what we know about physiology is that when you push harder, then you recover and you actually are able the next time to do more. And that's how we build, how people go from being, you know, out of shape to in shape to then in competitive. And if they want to be, you know, a provincial champion or an Olympian, well, then you've got to get further and further and further out of that comfort zone and push it more because that's where the gains come. And oftentimes that's where our learning comes from. So just please give it some thought and talk about it. That's, that's huge. And the next ones is, oh, before we go to the next one, I'm going to ask you one more time to, is there something else you can think of that can help you um, make that difference? Can we go back? No, that's good. Is there something that was missed that you feel is important that you'd like to add? 
just type into the chat, please, and hit everyone. And we'll just take one minute for this, and then we move on. Okay, well, looks like we can move forward. So I think I've covered most of this so that when there are cultural differences and different levels of personal comfort, two things, those of us who are shy, perhaps it's time that we look at how can we gently increase our level of comfort through knowledge, through experience, or through practice. Now, I want to give you an example. I feel very comfortable talking in groups now. It wasn't always that way. Before I became a teacher, we had to do presentations as part of our education. So I was a school teacher before I became, uh, well, actually I started in the restaurant business, then I went to university, became a school teacher. Then I went to the federal government and worked with Revenue Canada. And then from there, I get into adult facilitation and then went on and became a mediator. And that means doing a lot of workshops. But prior to that, even when I was back in university, I was very, very shy. And I did not like to speak publicly. And in fact, when I had to do my presentation, when I went to university and we had to videotape it, we had to critique it ourselves. And then the teacher would sit with some critique it. I remember borrowing teddy bears and dolls from my nieces and nephews, setting up a room, <laughs> setting up a camera and practicing with them continuously before I'd even videotape it and then look back at it because they became my audience. And, you know, and then of course, when I felt more comfortable with that, I started having some of my, my siblings sit around. And that was really tough because our family can be quite critical by times, even more critical than we are of ourselves. But I do believe that if we want to increase our personal comfort, just like the gym scenario, we need to push the envelope a little bit and get to the outside of our comfort. And it's scary and it's not easy. However, we can do that. And the more we discuss that with someone else and discuss the expectations and ask them for help, for guidance, whatever it may be, then we enable ourselves. And I think that's an important part of the whole issue about what can we do to make a difference? And if we look inside and say, let's face a few of our own fears, then it makes it easier for us to help others, to help ourselves, and to put ourselves in a position where perhaps we can make an even bigger difference. That being said, when it's a cultural thing, that becomes a little more complicated. Um, but sharing with other people what your culture is why it is and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations or discussing them in team meetings where people all get a chance to say, well, here's what's important from where I come from and this is you know, what I might want help with or what maybe isn't as negotiable so that everyone at least has an understanding of what our challenges are and what's important to us. It makes it easier because once we talk about it, it's out there on the table and we can then start to deal with what can or happen, what the options are. And of course, I think it might have been Gandhi or someone of that nature that said, when, what we can change. When we change the way we look at something, what we look at will change. So how we approach conversations, if we're doing the same thing over and over and we don't make any changes or look at variations. Uh, I think it was Einstein that said, when you do the same thing or crazy is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. He also said that if you're in a tough situation, the thinking that got you into that situation can't be the same thinking that gets you out of it. So there are times when we need to really give some thought to how we communicate with authority figures. What it is it that they're looking for? And I don't think I've ever had a good manager where I went to them with a the problem. They said, no, I don't want to hear it. But what they have said 
which the first time I heard it was a little challenging was, okay, so you've come to me with a problem. What I would hope you'll do in the future or what I would expect from you is come with the problem and also come with one or two options as to how we might approach it as opposed to just dumping it on my desk and expecting me to fix it for you. I need to know that you're able of, of thinking, of critical thinking, of being creative and of being part of the solution. And I know sometimes that seems like a big ask. However, it does help us push the envelope a bit and to be part of a solution. So just a few things that if you're not sure or if you're somewhat intimidated by speaking with authority figures, the more often you approach them and the way you approach them and if you're there to learn and to ask for help, rarely will people deny you help. It's just a, something that's built into us humans. Most of us would not walk by a crying child that's drowning and say, well, you know, they're not my kids, so I'm not going to dive in and help them. I think most of us tend to respond. It's kind of built into our DNA. Now, I might be wrong on that. That's an observation. So next one, please. All right. Now, this falls into the realm of like the conflict resolution, but again, it's important. Communicating in your spectral environment means changing, and I think we went over most of these things back in the difficult conversations, changing judgments to curiosity. If I could give humanity some gifts, that would be the first one. Because when we prejudge and we go on the attack or blame, we deny ourselves the opportunity to learn and we deny the people around us the opportunity to create an understanding and a dialogue that helps us all learn and understand the situation more fully so that we can find a suitable solution to it. And sometimes when we're in the midst of changes like COVID, sitting back and whining and complaining may not be that helpful. But having conversations and being open and asking people, what are they going through? What do they see? What do they experience? How does it impact them? And being genuinely curious and saying, ah, you're a whiner, you know, you just need to this or you just need to that. Very condescending and often creates resentment. So think about how can you change your judgment to curiosity where you want to learn and find out more and get to the bottom of things as opposed to just slough it off and blame and say, well, that's stupid or ridiculous. That's part of our contribution. So each of us sometimes um, will do something or say something or not do something or not say something that we could or should that would be helpful. And if we don't know, if we really spend a lot of time reflecting, we don't know. My suggestion is ask the other person that you're not getting along with. Say, have I said or done something that's offensive? It's very easy to jump to formal processes and try to have people, and there is a time and place for them. But quite often, probably 80 to 90% of the difficulties we run into is because of a poor communication or miscommunication. So I, I really request and suggest that for everyone's well-being that we take the time to consider our considered contribution and ask people if we're not sure what it is. What have I done? And be open to hear it. There's nothing worse than asking someone for their opinion and they try to give it to you, you shut them down. Um, I know that breaks up a lot of marriages and, and good relationships where people say, I don't feel heard. I don't feel understood and I don't feel valuable. So tapping the brakes. Now here's a couple of little suggestions that I find very helpful. When we look at someone who says something that's offensive to us, say, that's offensive. You should shut up or you shouldn't say that or you need to stop. Sometimes they react because they don't necessarily know what was uncomfortable or what, sorry, what was offensive about that. But when we respond, instead of reacting, say, you know what, I'm uncomfortable with that and here's why. Or this is the impact that has on me. That is then the beginning of opening the conversation to find out what it is they're really trying to say and where it comes from and 
for you to have the capacity to say, this is why it's uncomfortable, or this is why I find it offensive, and this is what's important to me. And can we talk about that so that both of you understand? And often that increases the respect and the trust between people because they've settled it. And they're not just fighting about who's right and wrong. The other one is I'm curious. These are just little things because when we say to someone, hmm, I'm curious about that response or I'm curious about that perspective. Can you help me understand how you got there? And listen, because you know what? The last time we talked about creating learning organized, learning, learning conversations, these two, these last recommendations are ways to do that. And if you're genuinely curious and you tell the person you're curious and you want to hear, Gandhi says, first seek to understand, then seek to be understood. And when you listen to someone, an interesting happens when you say, okay, now can I give you my perspective? Rarely will they say no. There's a couple of people, you know, not to mention any names, but there's a guy I know whose initials are Donald Trump, who doesn't seem to have great listening skills and is very difficult to talk to. Now, of course, people that are close to him would say that's not the case, but most of us probably um, experience in him as this person who doesn't have a lot of great listening skills or empathy. So aside from him, most people do have that. So can we go to the next one, please? All right. So we're getting very close to the end and I want to respect the fact, can we do this last survey and then I'll just shut it down or, or wait a second, we might need to shut it down now. Okay, yeah. So this is the last thing. Please indicate or identify who you can turn to for help or support. So just type one resource into the chat, please. And then send it. Okay, so I think we can stop that now. Uh, thank you. What I'd like to do is, Matt, if we could please jump ahead, we'll skip over a couple where when to mediate, when not. I don't think we need to go through those. And go to the summary at the end. I think it's about, yes. So this, this will be the last, there's only two left, this one and one more. And I know people have to leave. I thank you for your patience. So basically, here's just a quick summary. You know, a respectful workplace is everyone's concern and responsibility. We can all make a difference, even when we believe we can't. Um, and we can choose to change our contributions. We can change the way we look at things. Without curiosity and conversations, there's really not a lot of learning. Um, we can all focus on prevention and awareness and be part of that. Communication is everything and we are all capable of doing it. And that is that is the lifeline that keeps everything moving forward. And uh, people are at the heart of the workplace and let's not forget that because people are at the heart of the workplace, it's important for all of us to bring civility and humanity back to our workplaces. So the very next thing is simply the learning journal and it's an opportunity for you, if we can go to the next uh, one please, Matt. Yes, so maybe take a note. Once again, things become real when we write them down. What's your strength? What do you wanna work on? And what commitment will you make when you go back to your workplace 
to one thing, just one simple thing to help make the workplace more respectful. So I thank you so much. I know there's one piece that I didn't get to. However, I want to thank you all and please, please don't forget to fill in those evaluations which are going to be sent to you right away. And it's really important to get that feedback. So there's one more that I'm doing and I'd love to have your comments and feedback. Thank you for participation, for staying in here. And I apologize for running over. So over to, is it uh, Solange or? Uh, You've got me there, Mike. Uh, oh, Carolyn. I, okay. <laughs> Please wrap this up. Thank you, Carolyn. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I think that was a really valuable presentation, and uh, I think all of us will have found something in it that we can practice immediately, as well as in the months and uh, weeks ahead as we all navigate, uh, not just through COVID times, but in so-called normal mm -hmm. times. So, and thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, as Mike said, in a few minutes, you'll receive an evaluation form by email. We'd really appreciate it if you could just take five minutes to complete that survey. And we'll see you all again, uh, I hope, in two weeks. That's on December 1st for the final part of this series. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.